I will out music nerd all of you. Ever since I was a DJ at the age of eight, I've been obsessed with music. I'm sorry, what? I've wanted to call her out for like the whole last hour. That was Devo with Whip It, and now here's Blondie with the tide is high, I'd say to my portable cassette recorder and then wait patiently for it to come on the radio. I watched MTV for hours when my family first got cable, writing down the names of every video I saw, and then saved it for three decades. When I got older, I knew I wanted to do something with music, so I interned at 91X, and slave for record stores, music video producers, record distributors, and radio magazines. When the World Wide Web came along, it was like a drug for an info junkie like me. I was on my computer until the sun came up, falling asleep, waiting for a dial-up modem to load videos, and searching around for tidbits about just one more band. You're doing great. If I couldn't find what I was looking for, I would sometimes put something up on my stylish, mostly text, personal website in the hopes that someone would find it and give me some answers. I did that. <laughs> One subject I couldn't seem to find much information about was producer John Leckie. I became aware of Mr. Leckie when I was an 18-year-old audio production student at Cal State Northridge. His name had popped up on albums I loved by bands like The Posies, XTC, and Radiohead, and it got me curious. In 1970, he was one of the house engineers at London's famed Abbey Road Studios at the age of 21, which put him at the controls for some very famous recordings by Solo Beatles, Derek and the Dominoes, and Pink Floyd. Most importantly, he produced my favorite record of all time. Love you. <laughs> the 1989 self-titled debut album by Manchester, England's Stone Roses. A swirling mix of psychedelic imagery, boastful lyrics, and stunning musicianship, it regularly turns up at the top of British lists of the greatest albums ever made. You've probably never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Americans. <laughs> This was still before the days where the internet gave you a list of anyone's life work with a click or two. I put up what little info I had on a page I modestly titled, John Leckie, Studio Stud. <laughs> and started to get people writing to me about things I'd missed. A fan page for a record producer. <laughs> Nerd alert. One day, I got a very short cryptic email that read, I'm sitting here next to me is John. He says, what about the Roy Harper albums and also the Karma Canix? Karma and then K-A-N-I-X, great name. He said he will be in touch soon and thanks for the webpage. It was like getting a letter from another world. I replied with a thank you note but never got a response. A few years later, I found myself taking my dream vacation to England's Reading Festival. As long as I could remember, I'd wanted to stand in a cold, wet field surrounded by the various accents of the British Isles watching some amazing band that Americans could care less about with people who actually knew how to clap in unison and sing loudly. <laughs> I knew a British friend going on the third day, but otherwise, I was on my own. I got the courage to drop a note to the stranger who'd shown John my webpage, and within a few days, John himself replied that he'd be happy to see me and gave me his number to call him when I arrived. The day I touched down in England, I called John on a barely functional payphone, and he immediately picked up. I still couldn't believe what was happening, but played it cool, wondering if he could hear how much I was smiling through the phone. It turned out that he was going to the first day of writing to see a new band he was working with. He agreed to meet by the soundboard after their set. A few days later, I was herded into the festival along with thousands of real-life British people, <laughs> all proudly wearing the names of my favorite bands across their chest. I'd always secretly hoped I would get the true wet UK experience, but the rains came a few days early, leaving beautiful weather for the entire weekend. I walked the grounds by myself, my, by myself, taking it all in, making small talk with anyone whose eye I could catch, then headed over to a tent to watch the group whose debut album John had recently produced play a thankless slot early in the day. They went by the name of Muse. You've probably never heard of them. Anyways, 
They were amazing, but sounded more and more like Radiohead with each song. I started to worry that they'd never be seen as anything more than a ripoff, especially with them getting the man who produced Radiohead's best album, The Benz, I will fight anyone on that, to do their record. Their set ended when the singer jumped up over the drum kit and took out the drummer, leaving everyone wondering if either of them had survived. (laughs) After a few minutes of awkwardly scanning the crowd near the soundboard, I found John. In the pre-cell phone era, it was funny to look around for this man whose photo I'd only seen on the internet. We cautiously approached when we thought we'd found each other. John? Adam? I looked far too normal and sober to be a crazed fan slash stalker, and John didn't look like a rock star at all. He reminded me more of a kind old uncle or someone from Monty Python. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Dressed simply in a jeans jacket and t-shirt, one of the most famous British producers of all time could go completely unnoticed in a sea of music fans. Such is the life of a notable behind the scenes figure. He wanted to go back and say hi to the band, but I didn't have a backstage pass. Don't worry, just look like you belong back there. John said and started walking towards the entrance before I could offer to meet him later. I was sure they would stop me. He held up his pass for a security guard while I nervously looked the other way and stood right by in, right by in his side. Whew, made it. I was so terrified of being spotted as an imposter that I could feel my heart pounding, but no one seemed to care. We found the band, who luckily had survived, and kindly shared with me their own excitement about first meeting John and quietly told me they they too were a little worried about the Radiohead comparisons. Told you. (laughs) After a short while, John and I headed out and spent a few hours walking around, just the two of us, seeing bands and running into people he knew, some of whom had heard about or even seen my site. I almost felt like a disappointment by not being a raving American lunatic, but I did manage to ask him quite a few questions without sounding ridiculous. He was more than gracious and full of great stories, but was hardly a huge personality like so many of the famous people he'd been in studios with for three decades. Like many Englishmen, he had an understated charm that fit someone who didn't want to be in the spotlight. We barely discussed his musical past, but talked plenty about his family, going to festivals, his complete lack of musicianship, and visiting America, all while watching bands like Echo and the Bunnymen and Guided by Voices. I was completely at ease with him, but it was unreal having a secret celebrity hero as a wingman. (laughs) The most memorable part of the afternoon came when we went to go see another Manchester band called The Fall, who John had worked with in the mid-80s. They were taking a ridiculously long time to come on, so we stood and waited and waited and waited. As the minutes dragged on, I heard a group of British folk next to me talking about the Stone Roses. I smiled knowing that the man who helped make them so great was just a few inches away. I wasn't gonna say anything, but they just would not stop. They went on and on about how incredible the first record was until I just couldn't stand it. I elbowed the guy next to me and said, guess who's standing next to me? The guy who produced the album you're talking about. His face dropped for a few seconds, and he finally turned to his friends and said, this guy says the guy standing next to him produced the first Roses record. (laughs) To which his friend exclaimed, what, John (laughs) Leckie? Yes, John replied, not having noticed that I'd been talking to them. (laughs) In a second, they were all over him with back slaps and handshakes. It was a hilarious cacophony with all of them congratulating him at once. I could make up little bits like, well done, mate, and Roses, and Legend, and The Verve. And then they just quickly left him alone. One of them was simply shaking his head in disbelief as he walked away. John was clearly shocked and overwhelmed, but touched. I asked him if that had ever happened to him, and he laughed a little and simply said, no. (laughs) I stood there grinning, knowing I'd done my good deed for the day. Doing some silly bare-bones webpage that praised him was fine, but giving him a quick celebrity moment on home turf made the entire trip worth it. The fall finally came on, and unbeknownst to us, their singer's face was still bloody from a punch-up with his drummer, who had just quit. (laughs) Someone had been frantically running around the VIP area looking for anyone who could step in. Eventually, they found the Chemical Brothers manager, who hadn't played in years but was up for it. So (laughs) they turned to their poor new drummer, gave him a tempo, and he'd play something until they signaled him to stop awkwardly after everyone else had. After a couple of songs, we'd had enough and left. John was ready to head back home, and so we both weaved our way out of the tent to say our goodbyes. No autographs, no awkward fan photos. It had felt more like catching up with an old friend. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. Thanks, it was really nice to meet you too. Maybe we'll see each other again the next time we end up in the same city. 
I hope so. Talk soon. Cheers. We shook hands, and I walk, watched him walk away and honestly into the sunset without anyone batting an eyelash. I figured I'd never see him again. I really got to start a band so he can produce us, I thought to myself. <laughs> the rest of the festival was a blur of bands, bodies, Brits, and well, blur. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's spelled like it sounds, Julia. Blur. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing a ton of my favorite groups surrounded by singing crowds, losing their minds in merry old England was everything I'd hoped that it would be. At 27, I'd been trying to finally f do some things I'd always dreamed of doing, like going to England, and had been thinking more and more about playing music myself. The closest I'd ever got was a friend asking me to sing Sweet Child Oh Mine as a joke with his band at a high school concert, but when I couldn't sing it very loud in rehearsal, I got the boot. Being at shows always made me want to finally give it a shot. When I saw there was a karaoke tent at the festival, I couldn't resist. Even though I'd still barely ever performed any music myself, I'd always fantasized about playing for a festival crowd in England. This was as close as I was ever gonna get to playing Reading. I probably shouldn't have asked such a drunk and belligerent crowd who won the war in 1776. <laughs> but I knew I had All Right by Supergrass in my back pocket. <laughs> Years before Facebook, the crowd all held huge cards that could be a thumbs up or down. The host would pull the audience after a minute or so to see if the singer deserved to finish. As soon as I opened my mouth, all of the thumbs down cards turned upside down. <laughs> it was one of those self-aware Wonder Years moments where I knew it might not ever get any better than this. From the moment I walked off stage until I got to the train station that night, people yelled super gross at me and gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> now I could die happy. Praise from real life British people. <laughs> Fucking hell. I gotta start a band, I thought to myself. I emailed with John every year or two after that. Nothing major, as busy as he was, sometimes he'd reply, sometimes he didn't. I'd stopped updating his page shortly after meeting him because I was too busy after finally starting my own band. Two years later, I got up the nerve to send a him our first album. He didn't have to say something nice about us, but he did. Our producer, a fellow fan, was knocked out that John mentioned the production and those cracking American amps. It was only a few short sentences, but it meant more to me than any other review we got as a band. Then, a couple of years ago, a local bar called The Whistle Stop, <laughs> you've probably never heard of it, posted a flyer for their Britpot night and used a picture of the Stone Roses. A talented guitarist friend of mine saw it and asked if it was a dance club or a tribute act. A few emails later, I was the lead singer of the only Stone Roses cover band in America. <laughs> what just happened? It was just too weird for me to dress up and try and act as cool as singer Ian Brown, so we dressed as Guns N' Roses. <laughs> I pulled some moves like Jagger and Stones and Roses was born. I was ready to do just straight versions of the songs, but once I started figuring out ways to work in bits of Guns N' Roses and, Stones and Rolling Stones songs, I couldn't stop. <laughs> Even my purest guitarist loved it, but he just couldn't bring himself to dress as Slash, which I thought was even funnier because it looked like he just didn't get the memo. <laughs> it was a blast to do, but there just wasn't much point in trying to find the few Roses fans in California that would really appreciate it. No other Britpop club in California would have us. Our guitarist moved to North, Cal uh, North Carolina, and the band was done after just one fun show. Still, I couldn't shake how a couple of musician friends who I thought would be way too jaded to like it came up afterwards with their jaws still open, saying it was the best thing they'd seen in 10 years, maybe ever. I knew that if we could just get across the pond, England would really get it. <laughs> <laughs> the catch-22 was, that we couldn't get video of us playing to a crowd big enough to impress anyone overseas. I thought that maybe some studio recordings and a little humor could do the trick. So two years later, with two new guitarists, two slashes now, we got fired up to make it happen. John was kind enough to give us some encouragement and the secrets he used back in 1989. All Ian's vocals double-tracked but expertly mixed, he modestly advised. I mean, he practically produced us, right? You, you read that. When I sent him the finished track, he had the same reaction of shock and horror that most Roses fans do when they hear Manchester's Finest, 
Paradise City, The Rolling Stones, a deliberately annoying reggae breakdown, and TLC's Waterfalls all mashed together and dressed like GNR. I don't know what to say about all this, he replied. I'm gobsmacked, but what a great set of tunes. I cobbled together enough photos and cell phone footage of us to make a surprisingly decent video and sent it to dozens of festivals and agents without any response. Getting anyone interested with only three shows under our belt seemed ridiculous, but after a popular music website posted our video, I immediately got a message from someone begging us to come to Manchester. I got ready for the love fest, then 10 haters posted Facebook comments crying blasphemy. It did get 75 likes. I knew there had to be someone over there that could see past the top hats and studded bracelets to hear how good we were and love the ridiculousness of it all. For weeks, I would stay up all night messaging just one more club. Finally, we received a glorious acceptance letter from the Manchester Fringe Festival, and with that, impressed five other clubs into having us. We leave on July 11th. One of our Manchester shows is less than a mile from where Ariana Grande played this week. <coughs> and we're playing a little earlier so they can have an after party for the band playing the arena that night. Some shitty band from Poway called Blink-182. <laughs> you probably never heard of them. <coughs> Anyway, I can't believe I'm finally realizing my lifelong dream of playing England. Just like this. Still can't sing like Axl Rose. <laughs> <laughs> 